must constantly look at things in a different way. The Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast was created by two physical therapists out of the desire to learn more about the different educational roles in physical therapy and healthcare and how healthcare education works by talking with educational leaders and people with different perspectives within physical therapy and across interdisciplinary lines on how education can be improved to disrupt the status quo of healthcare education. This is our journey, and thanks for listening. Are you a third-year physical therapy student that excels on tests when you have study guides, checklists, and deadlines? With all of the information available about how to prepare for the NPTE, it's easy to get disorganized and not feel prepared going into the big day. NPTE Prep Success is an online course that provides PT students easy-to-use study guides and step-by-step guidance through the NPTE preparation. To learn more, visit kylericeprep.com. Thank you again all for your continued support, and now for the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. I'm your host, F. Scott Feel, and we are joined today due to a state of emergency. Um, the whole nation is currently undergoing the coronavirus pandemic, and we've been fortunate enough to be joined by some of the foremost experts in online education. Um, these guys have been doing it for a while now. Uh, they are well versed in how to transition from uh, a face to face in person uh, teaching to more of an online setup and we 're here today just to have a little talk about things that you can do to prepare yourself for that, how to make the transition, how to excel at teaching online because most of the universities across the country have gone to a completely online uh, method and, and model for the next rest of the year um, or at least you know throughout their semester so uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Gagnon, Dr. Blackington, and Dr. Shepard. Um, guys, welcome, and thank you so much for taking time out of your quarantined day to uh, help chat a little bit about all things online academia. I'd like to start first with, with a, just a very simple question. How are you guys handling this? Hmm. Don't all uh, jump at once. Uh, I'll start. Um, and I think that, you know, the, um, what I've been talking about with my colleagues across the country is that um, as leaders in higher education, we have to be that duck on water, right? So on the surface, we're staying calm and trying to um, use the principles of, you know, good teaching and learning. So whether you call that pedagogy or andragogy, I think, we're trying to stay calm. Um, the truth of the matter is that even for those of us that were already blended, we're because we're losing the face-to-face -face portion for an uncertain period of time, we too are adjusting to a, a new COVID-19 world. Um, and that, in, in my opinion, both as a leader and an instructor, I think it takes uh, you know, a, a good deep breath. I think it takes creativity. Uh, to a degree and being open to new ideas and new strategies and what and whether this is brand new for you or whether you've already been in it I think that that mindset is what we need to move forward yeah so in our program um, we are a hybrid program and the timing for us is that kind of this move to online happened right at the end of one of our lab immersions and beginning of a block of online instruction so in terms of timing I think we're a we're pretty blessed that we sort of got timing where, and it also happened for us right at the end of our students' clinical internship. So we didn't have any students pulled for more than a day or two. Um, so for us, we've had a, we, we already were online. We were already planning on teaching online for the next six weeks. So in that way, um, we've sort of had the luxury that a lot of folks haven't had to sort of um, continue on. And, and, um, and we are, though, making contingency plans for what was supposed to be scheduled for our immersion lab in April. We've already had to cancel that and move that. So that's sort of been the big discussions among our, fam our, our faculty. Um, I almost said our family, but our faculty is almost like a family, especially right now. So I think it's like those things are blending together for me. Um, but I also, you know, I'm the director of student affairs in our program. And so I think for me, the biggest thing that I've, I've been um, working on this week is that student support piece. We have 
cohort, we have two cohorts of 100 students in over 30 states across the country. And I'm, I'm happy to report that most of our students seem to be minimally impacted at this point, in meaning that they're able to kind of figure it out and move on. But we do have students that are, are more than minimally impacted and that have all sorts of different individualized issues. So a big issue we're having, even with the online instruction that we'd already planned, is that balance between keeping the normalcy and the schedule and keeping on track, but also providing that leniency and, and uh, the ability to kind of pause and figure this thing out. And I, I think from my vantage point, you know, uh, being involved with the post-professional side of a hybrid fellowship program, um, you know, it's uh, just as, as was mentioned earlier, you know, about trying to stay calm and, and stay, you know, really level set here. It's, it's been interesting because the, the fellows in training and, and the program I work with is, you know, there's just so many different practice settings they're in. Um, I've heard from several of them who are, you know, just not sure what's going to happen with their jobs because their clinics have closed. Um, some, some of them, you know, they don't know how, for how long. So, um, what I'm trying to manage here is, you know, what Kendra and I really talk a lot about is, you know, how do we humanize this piece? Because we have, you know, our own goals, the program must go on, but then we have these individuals, uh, participants in our program who, you know, they say, look, I, I don't know what, you know, what's going to happen with my coursework, you know, going on if I, if I'm not in clinic. Um, we're a clinical based program. So, you know, my, my, my heart and my mind has been very consumed with just the, you know, just the realness of this. And I can tell you the clinic hours I've had, even though they're minimal, um, you know, I've had to basically give them away, you know, and, and I don't honestly want to be doing patient care right now just to try to uphold, you know, social distancing, but it is, it is very strange and, um, and scary. I'll be completely honest from my, my vantage point. Yeah, that's such a great point, Mark. I mean, humanizing this whole thing at the end of the day, really, that should default into our first uh, step, I think, you know, and, and method, because, I mean, I, I've been working home health for, for a couple of years now. And, uh, you know, that took a huge hit when Medicare came around and, and PDGM, uh, the numbers dwindled, I saw a bunch of PTAs get fired. Um, and then when coronavirus came, you know, the COVID-19 came in, it just, you know, assisted living facilities aren't allowing visitors. Um, and rightfully so, you know, I, I see it could be very difficult um, as a home health practitioner not to be concerned about your patients, not to be concerned about yourself and your family, you know, because you become a, a higher risk as a, as a carrier, you know, traveling from home to home to home. And of course, we take every precaution we can. And, you know, I, I wiping down your, your uh, equipment and, you know, you know, setting up clean workstations and, you know, washing your hands and sanitizing. And, you know, it, it seems like I, I've dried up from all the alcohol that I'm using lately. You know, my hands are dry and cracking and, you know, it's uh, my equipment is squeaky clean at this point. So we're doing all that we can, but, you know, at the same time, there, there is that human element of like, we've, we've got to do the best thing we can for, for our patients, for our students, you know, for our families. So, uh, you know, I can definitely see not wanting to just dive into the clinic and see a bunch of patients right now, for sure. Um, well, let's, let's look at this, this first question then. Uh, you've been moved to an online program for the rest of the semester. You were normally a in-person, face-to-face, brick-and-mortar school. What should faculty be looking at as far as maybe equipment or readiness or preparedness, things that they might need to move to this online hybrid type setting for the rest of the semester? Yeah, um, I guess I can jump in. Um, I, I think, you know, the first thing that I would say to faculty is that, you know, this is not really online education because you're doing in a week what it takes, what it has taken many of us that work in these environments, years of frustrations, failure, trial, error, mistakes, and you're doing all of that in a week. And so, and, and also probably without 
um, a lot of the kind of tools and technology support and platforms that a program that's built from the ground up to be hybrid or online has. Right, so literally I, emergency preparedness and bare yeah. bones minimum, all right. So I think just being a little bit gentle on yourself and doing the best you can is kind of the first thing I would, I would tell faculty. I think there's, you know, there's a lot of really substitution level stuff you can do that people are probably already doing. Record your lectures, post, you know, discussion boards, post documents, readings. Um, but again, to Mark's point, I think that there are tools that are re re readily available that you don't have to be a tech expert to use that can really humanize. So um, as, as Mary mentioned as well, you know, Zoom um, has a free platform that you can use to do group face-to-face -face meetings. And if you are, uh, and even just doing those touch points once a week, you know, posting those recorded videos and then doing a quick Q and A or what once a week will help those students, I think, um, have that human connection and also process and, and be able to ask questions and, and dig a little bit deeper into the learning. And if your students don't have the, um, you know, the um, uh, bandwidth, you know, internet speed to do live classes, there are some really great asynchronous uh, video platforms, um, including um, Flipgrid is one that I really love, not sponsored, but I just love that platform a lot. And that one seems to be, it's asynchronous, so it doesn't require quite the, the bandwidth and internet speed, and most students can use it on their phone. So a couple of really easy things you can do that don't require you to totally flip things on its head, and I think be a, t a tech expert, um, you know, because obviously there's a lot of cognitive load in learning the tech as well. And I, I agree with everything that Kendra said. And I would say that, you know, I've, I've been talking to people um, about this. Most people are going immediately to Zoom and doing a live session because it feels really comfortable because you're used to doing live sessions. And I think that that is an easy button to push. Um, the problem that our university is finding is that um, it, it's not as easy as you, as it may seem, because although you can do it and set it, you know, give everybody the link, uh, there are complications in terms of the overall um, connectivity of the internet. So because I'm a program that has done asynchronous, and I'm very comfortable with it. I think from a, um, a countrywide perspective there, and you know, you've got to meet today's needs, but then it's possible to maybe use a combination of synchronous and asynchronous. Because, you know, Saturday, um, uh, somebody can record three sessions, get them ready for next week, and they're not going to be perfect. Um, I think that's a really big thing I've been trying to message. You've got to let go of perfectionism. It's okay to cough and sneeze and the dog barks and your kids go, mom, um, it's all right. Because you know what? That makes us, speaking of humanness, it makes us human. And you should never think that a recorded session, whether it's a podcast like this, Scott, as you know, or any other session is perfect. And if we can all embrace that, it, the stress will go down. I think, um, I, you know, we've always talked about the uh, community of inquiry model, meaning that, you know, in a blended or online program, you want social presence, teaching presence, and cognitive presence. And I add psychomotor for PTs. So, there are really simple ways that you could add um, teaching presence is your leadership. You go on and make an announcement every week, whether it's your voice or your video and say, hey guys, I, all right, we're in our new normal. I hope you're all doing well. Make a personal, reach out to every student in a group format personally, and then show your teaching leadership as well by being organized. Here's your to-do list for the week. Um, and then social presence, ask students to get together offline and you know, work on a case and then get back together. Um, and cognitive and psychomotor presence means bringing in good cases, that good teaching um, that we're all already doing, some of us blended, but some of us face-to-face, -face, and bring them into the online format to give students um, active learning experiences. Don't make them just watch and watch and watch. Give them something to do. Um, you don't have to grade it necessarily, but engage them. And I think they will feel um, more engaged and you'll feel more comfortable with what's going on. Those are excellent points. And I think, Mary, you know, your, your point about perfection really hits home. And, you know, I think hey, Kendra and I kind of laugh, you know, because we've developed plenty of online, as I'm sure you have, Mary. And, 
Um, you know, it's, it's hard, you know, especially this day and age, everybody's stuck at home. Your kids are most likely stuck at home. You're going to be with your pets probably too. And, you know, there's going to be a bark in the background when you're recording something or, or, or doing a live session. There's going to be kids who come in um, or sounds or things that make you feel like oh, this, is, this is unprofessional. And I think um, you kind of have to put that aside. I think students actually like it. The, the reviews I've heard for, from, from times when that's happened to me has been, I really liked, you know, that the realness of the person who's coming through. And, and I think that really was something that took me aback and being like, wow, that was probably one of the worst lectures I thought because of whatever happened. And, you know, I just didn't have the time to redo it um, because otherwise you would be doing it over and over and over again. And, and I think Mary said, you know, one of the easiest things is the asynchronous piece because you probably have lectures that are uh, already prepped to, to go week to week to week and you can flip those. Um, but what I would say from my vantage point I think we would all probably agree is, you know, flipping your content isn't easy, just as easy as doing that. Um, you know, I think when it comes to lectures, one of the, the tips or tools I've really tried to adhere to is really keeping the lectures very short and bite-sized. Um, you know, with students these days, um, you know, we think about a normal traditional brick and mortar layout where you may have an hour, 50 minutes, hour, sometimes longer to do lecture-based time. Uh, you know, and not, not all that time is sometimes dedicated to, you know, stage on the stage type stuff. But uh, I would say, you know, when you're flipping your, your content, particular any PowerPoint based stuff, if you're doing it in classroom for 30, 45 minutes, don't record it for 30, 45 minutes. Um, try to break it up as best you can. Uh, and if you do a live session, the, the big thing that I struggled with and I see faculty struggle with is re-lecturing things you recorded. Um, and so if you think about scaffolding within the week, you want to make sure that your asynchronous or recorded uh, content is different from your live or synchronous uh, content. So think about ways, as Mary was saying, make it active. Um, if you're doing something through Zoom, you wanna make sure that people are engaged. Um, it, it's really hard talking to a computer when you don't have people out you know around you and so I when I do live sessions I pick my computer up I put it up as high as I can I'm standing up I am moving around as if I am in front of a classroom because otherwise you fall flat you lose students way easier um, and if you're re-lecturing what you did uh, you know you're asynchronous you're gonna lose students right away so I think easy things to do break up your lectures as best you can um, and, uh, you know, try to expand or add depth to your content in a live session. And, you know, one of the things that, it, that all of this is making me think about is in this, in our hybrid model, you know, we built our model to think about what is, what is it that it, the only things we can do together here face to face, and that's what we do face to face. And I think you could kind of apply that here as you're thinking about moving your course to online. Um, so to Mark's point about don't re-lecture. You know, content delivery does not need to happen face to face, whether online or in a lab environment. So, so use that time for the things that really need to happen with you, with you all there together. Um, so, yeah, talk discussion of cases and breakout groups and all those kinds of things can be really effective. And you know, and I was also thinking about you know when Mary talked about all the different types of presence and teaching presence. I think right now that's so important that leadership. I mean, I just really love that. But also thinking about when you're making those announcements and kicking those things out to students. Think as much as you can about using video because again, I think just seeing your face and hearing your voice, even if you're in, you know, the perfectionism issue, even if you're in sweats with your hair back, it's okay. If you're sitting in your car waiting for something real quick, it's okay, you know, but just a quick video of like, hey guys, how's everybody doing? Here's what we're going to do this week. Let go of the perfectionism. And uh, to me, one of the hardest things when I transitioned to online was getting like comfortable with myself on video, if I'm really honest. And now I'll like record a video anywhere, any place. So just like let go of that and get really comfortable because your students are just going to, they're going to love that connection of seeing your face and hearing your voice. And, yeah. I, and I think I would totally agree, Kendra. And I think that um, one way uh, to do that is to consider, you know, when you do that, um, flip the classroom and, and keep the really high impact things for when you're synchronous you don't always have to be synchronous with all 40, 50, or 100 people. Um, 
you know, we're, we're learning to use Zoom in a different way than we've used it before. So we're, we're playing with each other with faculty right now. We're trying like breakout rooms and we will put the student in rooms and we'll rotate different faculty and lab assistants between the rooms for that live time so that when we dissect a case, it's not one in 40, it's one in seven people or one in 10, depending on how um, in depth the case is. So those are things I think to make people feel like they're getting personal. They're actually gonna get a little bit more personal instruction to me in this new world that we're in than they did. And I think all faculty are capable of doing it. Just think about rooms in Zoom rather than groups in your classroom. Yeah, great points, all of you. Um, I'd like to add a hashtag hoodie as I am in my sweatshirt and hoodie today and quite comfortable. Same here. Um, yep. And, you know, that's, it is what it is. I mean, we're, we're just real life in it right now. So um, I want to make this valuable for our audience on both sides because we have listeners that are students and we have listeners that are faculty. And so, uh, you know, Mary, you made some good points there with faculty having to get comfortable. And I want to come back to that uh, towards the end of this episode. But right now, I want you guys to kind of think a little bit on the other side of, of the spectrum. What are students having to deal with going through all this? What are some of the pros and cons that students are seeing going to a, an online model over the next however long it may be? So I sort of, I think, uh, you know, started to talk about this a little bit before. Again, our students are used to this model, you know, but, but I will tell you, even it, when we aren't in a time of crisis, um, online education, remote learning can often be isolating um, and, and lonely. And so that's actually something, you know, I, I, my role in our program is director of student affairs. And I work with students a lot on those issues of, you know, how do they become self-motivated, set up a schedule, um, make sure they have the supports they need, both, you know, their, their own family and social supports in their own communities, but also helping professionals in their communities if they need counseling and things like that. And so what I think I've seen this week, um, is that those issues are just, uh, and multiplying, um, you know, students are just feeling, um, even though they're, they're used to this environment, they are feeling uncertain. The, all of the uncertainty and anxiousness and helplessness and lack of control we're all feeling. Um, and, and then some of them have these very highly um, individualized issues where, you know, maybe their spouse has experienced a layoff and their kids are home and they're figuring out how they're going to be, um, you know, be able to work through the program or they've got family or friends that are stuck places that can't travel. So their, their support people are, are separated from them or need to be because of their, their own health and safety. So, um, so what I've really been trying to tell our students and, and, and kind of working between our students and faculty is I just don't think we can over communicate with each other right now. Um, our students, um, you know, our program is organized into academic teams and each academic team of students, it's eight to 10 students that has a faculty coach. So we are really encouraging our students to stay in close contact with their faculty coach, um, elevating those issues up through me to the program director down to the students. Um, you know, I've been talking with a lot of students where we've got a, a student assistance program that our students can utilize to get um, face to face counseling in their communities or if those community-based counselors are doing telehealth however they're delivering those services they can access those and so i think you know what i would just encourage faculty too and i'm sure that we're all this is all very friend of mine is you know remember again that that um that our students are you know we, this isn't just a matter of moving our courses online our students are dealing with really serious issues that are impacting their ability to learn and so we have to kind of, again, balancing that sticking to a schedule and sense of normalcy with understanding that nothing is normal. And we've got all got a, these individual issues we've got to manage right now and helping support our students in that so they, they can be successful and continue to learn. Yeah, and I, I love that. And I think that communication, I think it's like the three C's. So communication, compassion, and community. So communicate, you know, that, that is something that as faculty, that's our responsibility. Let's keep communicating, keep the doors open. Um, and then, but students also need to know that if they're struggling, they should communicate to their faculty. Um, and, and faculty, on the other hand, also have to listen and respond with compassion. And, you know, we have, you know, typically strict dress code policies, um, you know, 
policies on every level because of course we're professional programs but you know we we have many students who are parents and working at home and so I think responding with compassion, I've had a few people text me and say, you know, I just, I don't know if I can keep my kids in a separate room. And I said, we understand that. And we're gonna respond to you with compassion and, you know, do your best that you can, but we're not, again, expecting, it's, it's new for everyone. Um, and then I think community, uh, we have to build community together. So students reaching out to other students um, they already have a lot of them have Facebook pages. We have a student center, uh, a, you know, an online a course management system just to communicate. But, you know, maybe we need to more formalize, create buddy systems and things like that um, to support students. Um, but I think students need to know that everybody needs to reach out to each other to form a sense of community. Our new normal means uh, doing that and be being pretty vigilant about it to make sure everybody's okay to maybe your study group now becomes a completely di different group of people or you have multiple online study groups. Yeah, and I think, you know, I kind of alluded to earlier just, you know, from, from, you know, my experience uh, with DPT students, you know, the anxieties, um, you know, with just the pressures of being in, in uh, <laughs> the PT program or there regardless if you're in online or, or brick and mortar. And, um, you know, I think Kendra's points are super, super important to consider. And Mary, your, your thoughts on communication and compassion are so important. And, and I, I think the listener really needs to reflect on that piece there. But um, from, from a student standpoint, and, and even from a clinician, because I deal with the post-professional side as well, is just you know understanding that life is happening outside of our classroom walls, uh, digital or, or brick and mortar, and and you know having that empathy for what's going on and the compassion piece is something that I think is important, and I think communication of that is 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 really important too. Uh, example of what I typically do on every Friday, I will send out a message you know just on whatever is in my mind and, and obviously with the news the past couple of weeks you know this discussion on the virus has been top of mind um and so i think you know relating to the students that you know i know you guys are anxious i'm anxious too um i don't know what the future holds for a lot of these things and i know you know there's a lot of stressors but we'll get through this we'll work through this we'll be together through this whole process and, um, you know, I, I would say from a student standpoint is to understand that we are, you know, in, in a unique situation with different pressures, too. And I think if we, um, you know, are, are, are forgiving of people for what happens at certain times, I think that's important. Obviously, we have competencies and, and standards and rigor that need to be met, but we have to look at ways to accommodate as many individuals as we can in this time because uh, we're in crisis and there's a lot of things that are just happening that we never probably thought we'd have to deal with at this magnitude at this speed um, and so it's just it's one of those things I think we just need to be mindful of and both on the faculty and student side. And you know it re really reminds me when I was a junior faculty one of my mentors said to me Kendra there are no emergencies in education and that's something that I've just been continuing to sort of um, remember and think about. Um, obviously, this is all very serious and our edu what we're doing in education is incredibly important and necessary, but there are no emergencies. Everything is, is figure outable, to, to quote a, re a recently popular book, right? We can, um, you know, and that's what I keep kind of telling our students, let us know what's going on and we'll figure out a way to get it, get it done and to, to work together to get through this and get to the other side of this. And so, you know, I think that's another kind of blessing that we have in education, that we have all of these multimedia uh, platforms that we can use. We have flexibility, um, we're able to accommodate. And, and in some ways we're having to do that right now in real time, because as much as we're trying to plan, we don't know what's happening tomorrow or next week or in a, a month or, or two months. So as long as we just keep communicating with each other and, and working together, um, you, know, I, I, you know, we'll all get to the other side of this for sure. Yeah, great points. Um, I just want to take a minute to thank you guys for being so flexible and for being able to come together on this uh, little uh, state of emergency episode. 
because we are such a hands-on field, right? Because we are such a, um, you know, connection people to people type uh, a profession. I, you know, I, I think it is a little bit tough to somewhat come to the terms of, you know, a lot of this stuff's going to have to move to online now. So you guys have been doing it for a while. Let's go back to the very beginning of your journeys with online education. Let's say it's a, you know, you're a brick and mortar school, you're in this emergency scenario, you're moved online for the rest of the semester. Bringing it back full circle to the faculty side of things again, what are some of the best tips, tricks, pointers, things that you can put out there for faculty or who are having to make this transition uh, if they've never done it before and they're just getting started? Yeah, I'd say for, for me, um, <clears throat> my, my big piece is less is more. Um, I think oftentimes when it comes to technology, a lot of institutions have, you know, shiny tech tools, if you will, um, that, you know, when I was going into the hybrid environment, especially in, in entry level program, you know, there was a lot of options for cool things to use, Flipgrid, Bongo, Zoom, you know, whatever you're using. It, it, your LMS typically has a lot of cool plugins and features too. Um, and I went, I went just, you know, crazy with them all. I had every type of thing in there. I had every type of assessment that you could possibly want to do. Um, and, and what I realized is I, I was veering away from my learning objectives. And so if you keep your learning objectives at top of mind, even as you transition to this, this time, uh, you know, if you're going from brick and mortar, traditional model to, to online, which many of us are, obviously, you know, look at your learning objectives and let those be your guide. Um, and then understand that less technology is, is sometimes better because you're decreasing the cognitive load that st students need to um, basically learn and use because a lot of times, even though students are pretty quick at adapting because they're, you know, used to technology, um, you know, we have to remember that there's anxieties around learning new things right now. So it's just like motor learning. If your stress response is going on, you're not getting sleep, they're, they're dealing with the same motor learning issues just now with technology learning. Um, so I think, you know, keeping it simple, keeping less is something that I've learned more and more. You trim the fat and be very intentional based off of learning objectives. I agree 100%, Mark, and I, I would say a, a couple of additional things. Um, first of all, there is a myth out there that because someone is millennial or a certain age that they are, is, they are a digital learner, um, and there's a really good article, and I'll, Scott, I'll share it with you so that you can post it, called The Myths of the Digital Native and the Multitasker, and I think that we have to... Um, one of the biggest eye-opening things for me when I started doing blended learning was that it, it's, you know, other than people posting on Facebook and um, Instagram, the skills that you need um, can be complicated for people that are on Instagram. So I think um, acknowledging that and that everyone's going to struggle with the technology. But in particular, I think the area that's, you know, that everyone, including myself originally was worried about was psychomotor skill development. So I would say if you're starting from scratch, um, use the technology that you have to create, as Mark said, short, very focused demonstration videos. If you don't have the bandwidth to create it, there's YouTube, there's a, um, a <clears throat> program called ICE. I know our university has it. They are demonstration videos that are already there. Um, or maybe as, as <clears throat> colleagues across the United States, we can share with one another, you know, wouldn't that be awesome that we get out of our separateness and, and come together and start sharing some video resources. But I would say keep those videos short and you can talk to the student while you're videoing. Let's say you're doing a technique, you can be, you know, moving and talking, or you can have a video, like sometimes if I'm doing something like um, where someone's moving in bed, I'll I'll take the YouTube, I'll record the video, and I'll talk over it. Um, and again, I do that asynchronously through um, screen capture, but you could do that live in Zoom. But again, focusing on what you would in a classroom, but very simply, pay attention to the position of the 
therapist's body. Notice the hand placement. Notice how the patient's hand is not grabbing, it's, it's cuffed. So being, being uh, and you don't have to show everything. You don't have to show every, every item. You can show general principles and then give students assignments that they have to try in their environment. Um, and to that, we're, we're kind of trying to come up with some guidelines. So, you know, for students, they need, uh, they've always needed their video camera, but is it possible that we need them to get a patient? And if they're completely socially distanced, they may not. So we're going to have to be, be flexible with that. And we may ask them, do you have another person in your environment that can do the videoing? Um, in terms of like during a practical exam, it would be nice if I could say, hey, Scott, could you zoom in a little bit on Kendra's hands for me? Um, so those are things I think that as faculty, we need to pay attention to. Um, and I do feel the technology is there for some um, feedback that's real time, which would be, be beneficial. You can also have students upload their videos and give them asynchronous feedback um, <clears throat> in giving that, assuming they have a patient or something to move uh, during that process. So those are my initial thoughts, especially from a psychomotor perspective. So agree with everything else that's already been kind of shared. Um, again, as Mary said, I would say, you know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There are lots of great resources out there, some free, some for a, you know, a, a pretty um, nominal fee, subscription fee. Uh, as Mary mentioned, you know, collaborating across different um, faculty, you know, I, I'm a pediatric PT educator. So there's a lot of me out there that are all trying to figure out the same thing. And we're, you know, and we've all, a lot of us have been talking to each other because there's not any reason for all of us to be recording that same lecture, right? So this is a time where we can really think about how we can work together to try not to duplicate effort. Um, you know, some things that I, I would think about again, Mark, you know, mentioned simplify, simplify, simplify. And I think another way to do that is to really think about, you know, utilize uh, principles of backward course design. So try to think about your course, not in terms of content delivery, but in terms of learning. What are, start with the outcomes you want and work backwards, because maybe in this online environment, what that looks like is a little different than what it might have looked like if you were delivering it face to face. So again, that idea of backward course design and getting away from content and more on learning, I think is, is really critical. Again, knowing that we all have accreditation standards and certain content that has to be delivered, but really thinking about it in terms of design. Um, you know, I think humanizing, we've said this a lot, use as much video as you can, whether it's face to face um, or not face to face, Synchronous. Um, this feels fa very face. You know, video feels very face to face to me. Uh, but you know, whether it's synchronous or asynchronous, um, there is a wonderful group of uh, the California Community College um, has a great group um, that is. I think it's the online network of educators, O N E, and they have some wonderful webinars and little short clips about, and they're all a lot of it focuses on humanizing and it'll introduce you to different tools you can use almost all of them are very free and accessible so again i think there's a lot you can do with video um you know and it's even for those psychomotor type skills so you know but you do have to be mindful if you're within your lms that video files are really big and so you know just you know, recording a video and posting it in your LMS sometimes will overload that. So you might need to work with your institution's IT department to figure out, you know, using it at Baylor, we use um, Kaltura within Canvas for that, um, for that streaming. But if you, for whatever reason, don't have that capability, there's tools out there. You could create a Facebook group for your class and students can load videos and you could load, you know, you guys can, can interact in that way. Um, I've mentioned Flipgrid, the Flipgrid, um, students don't have to have an account to use Flipgrid, but it's, it's easy to access on their, um, on their devices. And as an educator, there's a, there's a way you can give them private feedback in addition to the video discussion. So um, Padlet is another, it's sort of a, a, a free resource where you can curate content and there's all kinds of people that use it in really interesting ways. I sort of use it as a Pinterest board for curating content, but uh, but I know lots of uh, folks use it for uploading videos and for discussion because it does have a social uh, aspect to it. And I'm sure there's many, many more. Those are just a few off the top of off, off the top of my head. But again, 
thinking about using video to have students demonstrate the skill and you to give feedback, I think you'd be surprised at how engaging and rich that, that interaction can be. And then finally, the last thing I, I really th am thinking a lot about is be thoughtful about access. You know, our students sometimes live, if they're back home, um, they live in communities that don't have access to really high internet speeds, that is what is required of video. Um, they can't now go to the public library or to the coffee shop to get on fast internet because those public spaces are closed. So, you know, and I worry a little bit that some of those pieces might disproportionately affect some of our students who are already struggling or who are from various disadvantaged populations, you know, low socioeconomic status, out in rural communities, those sorts of things. So be really thoughtful when, with what you're doing that you're creating as, as inclusive of a learning environment as you can. And again, making uh, the ability to create alternative assignments or work with those students to make sure they're able to be successful if those if those if access isn't is an issue for them. Wow. <laughs> that was a uh, a lot of really good tips there. That was uh, a lot of strategy, a lot of uh, thoughtfulness. Um and I can't thank you guys enough for taking the time to do this. I really do think our audience will will hopefully learn a little bit from this. Um, at the very least, we're just trying to do our part to, to help get the word out and, and spread the message. I know it's, it's, it is crisis time and a lot of uncertainty. So while we're holed up and quarantined, hopefully we can use some of the social media and digital marketing or digital media rather and, um, you know, podcasting and stuff like that to just spread the word on what's working, tips, tricks, things that we can do to help further education. Um, so thank you guys all for your time and for coming on and, and for being flexible with this. Um, why don't we do this? I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, allow you guys to wrap up and let people know where they can find you and where they can reach out if they have uh, other um, questions or follow-up information. We'll go uh, Kendra, Mary, then Mark, if you don't mind, and then we'll, uh, I'll put all the links in the show notes for everybody. Okay, so um, you can reach me at, via email at Kendra underscore Ganyan at Baylor.edu. I'm also on Twitter at Kendra PDPT. Okay, and um, the best way to reach me is email maryb at nova.edu. Uh, but for those people that might be in crisis, um, I'm going to also put my cell phone out there. I don't know if I'll regret, but I don't think I will because I think these are really cha challenging times for everyone. So my phone number, and I'd appreciate a text first, uh, and then we can set up a time to chat, is uh, 954-560-7670. Yeah, I think, um, you know, social media-wise, I'm uh, pretty active on Twitter, so uh, my, my um, handle is at Shep, S-H-E-P-D-P-T. Um, find me there. Um, if you need, same, same with uh, Mary, if you need me um, in crisis or, or what have you, uh, shoot me a text, 276-608-5603. Well, thank you guys so much, and we'll get this out to the public as quick as possible. You guys have a great and safe rest of the week, and uh, look forward to talking to you guys once this is all uh, finished up and, and things have calmed down a little bit. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Access to healthcare is one of the largest issues facing both providers and patients, as millions of people worldwide lack timely and affordable access to healthcare. Anywhere Healthcare, a telehealth platform, is a simple, low cost option for providers and patients that eliminates the barriers to access to all kinds of healthcare. To find out more, check out anywhere.healthcare which is available on our show notes. And if you use the code HET in all caps when you email to sign up, you'll save 25% off the total cost. Thank you for attending class today. And we hope that you learned something and gained value from the content. If you'd like to schedule office hours with us, feel free to add us on Twitter at HET Podcast, on Instagram, HET Podcast, on Facebook, the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, and the homepage, healthcareeducationtransformationpodcast.com. And for those of you following along in the syllabus, extra credit can be obtained by liking us, sharing us, and leaving a review. Let's continue our journey up Mount Educational Success as lifelong learners.